and a particularly disturbing form of terrorism profiling has been the US federal government's use of race as a basis for the detention without due process of Arabs, Muslims and South Asians. And its subsequent use of the anti-terrorism investigation simply as a vehicle for the disproportionate application of US immigration laws against detainees who are found to be innocent of any terrorist activity. In the wake of September 11th, the United States detained hundreds if not thousands of people of colour on suspicion of terrorist activity. On, and on some of them up to a year, all without charges. On behalf of, of various human rights organisations, I've interviewed people who've been locked away for a year, they don't want to do a thing about it, they just want to get on with their life. And almost none of those individuals were ultimately found to have been in any way connected to terrorism. Yet many continued to be held without being formally charged with any crime or immigration violation. You know, it was only on July the 22nd that a bomb went off in downtown Oslo, Norway. And as soon as the bomb went off, media organizations began reporting on jihadist organizations. They talked about a controversial, controversial European imam. And they talked, of course, about the ever-present Al-Qaeda. And it turned out the terrorist wasn't a Muslim at all. And this Bivik was a Norwegian Christian who, had, who, as you know, committed unspeakable acts, killing many, many young people. And he boasted of his links to neo-Nazi groups, Islamophobic organizations, and other radicals. And we don't hold Christians or conservatives or liberals responsible for Bivik's unspeakable acts. Lunatics are not limited to any nation, ethnicity, or religion. But we certainly hold all Muslims responsible for the insane acts of a few. What we are witnessing is the constant drip of sanity slipping from our grasp as our apathy, and boy are we apathetic, allowing whispers of anti-Muslim sentiment to become part of a mainstream conversation. And I say to you that we cannot tackle manifestations of intolerance unless we well understand how the constant use of fear pervades our everyday life and how that fear is being used to influence how you and I think and how you and I act. It is that same manipulation of fear that has allowed military escapades into countries beyond those who bombed the Twin Towers. And it's that same message that has been exploited by participating governments to reduce civil liberties and infringe upon human rights by allowing such places as Guantanamo Bay to exist. I am one of the very few people who ever meet who's gone to Guantanamo Bay and gone there for years. I was there two months ago and I spent two weeks there. And I for a moment stop my talk and I will say to you that I went to Guantanamo Bay as a lawyer and I came out as a broken father. I never thought in my lifetime that I would go to such an evil place and see such evil being done. And you too are aware of that. Because it was only, it was in January of 2002 that each and every one of us here 
So the first shocking images of human beings in rows, in aircraft, hooded, shackled, for transportation across the Atlantic, much as other human beings have been carried in slave ships 400 years earlier. And you and I witnessed the captors humiliating these anonymous human beings, unloaded at Guantanamo Bay, crouched in open cages in those orange jumpsuits, all deliberately displayed for all of us by CNN and other news groups. Each and every one of us saw that. And for each and every one of us, for the watching world, no knowledge of international humanitarian conventions was needed to understand that what was being witnessed was simply unlawful. This was not a manifestation of the Geneva Conventions at work, nor was it an act of deportation or, or extradition. It was far worse. It was the unlawful transportation to a world outside the reach of the law. For each and every one of those individuals and intended to be so. In that world, crimes against humanity were to be carried out in Guantanamo Bay. And Guantanamo Bay doesn't just consist of those cages, those cages that you see. I can tell you that people go into those cages think they're having a holiday going in there. As opposed to, there are three other prisons in Guantanamo, in concrete edifices with no windows, Camp 5, Camp 6, where Omar Khadr has spent most of his life. And Camp 5 and Camp 6, as the Pentagon will tell you, is designed for enhanced interrogation techniques. Torture. And now we have Camp 7. And the one word you're not allowed to talk about in Guantanamo is number 7. And somewhere out there, I'm not allowed to talk about it. We have prisoners in there who came from Europe about a year and a half ago. And they're going to be there forever. And there's no one there to help. And of course, as I said, amongst all those desperate human beings in those onsets was a young Canadian, 15-year-old, Omar Khadr, who has been detained there since the age of 15. <coughs> he's now 23 years of age. And a lot of you here have brothers and sisters, little brothers, little sisters. I have a 15-year-old boy who just turned 16. And I think about that all the time. And in my years of going to Guantanamo Bay, I have never seen Omar Khadr walk, other than being marched frogged into a courtroom. Omar Khadr was always chained to the floor in a concrete cell with no windows. And he sits on a chair there, and I sit on a chair next to him, looking straight at him. I touch him, I've kissed him, I've hugged him, and we speak with our heads together while the military sit next to us. There's no privacy. And our government knows that's the conditions he's in. Our governments have visitors. The Department of Foreign Affairs that meet Omar meets him under similar conditions. Omar Khadr is someone who is entitled, like the rest of those detainees, to all kinds of international protections. But our governments are not asked for them. And by not asking, you become complicit. And understand that these tragic human beings, because human beings they are, I just simply shut away. They're under incessant inhuman conditions. They, there have been over 780 people in Guantanamo Bay. 
And only four of her have been shot. And given a trial. These ind individuals have no opportunity to see the evidence. They're not told when they go to court. They don't get to see a lawyer. They don't get to get a counsel with us. They don't get to speak to the media. They don't get to speak to their families. They're invisible. And they're invisible there for a reason. The reason is Dick Cheney told you years ago. These are the very worst of the worst. So you don't get to see them. You don't get to hear them. You can allow your imagination to run riot. And you can go to bed at night time feeling good about yourself because those horrible people are locked away. We're safe. And we, each and every one of you here, have allowed us to have I can tell you that those individuals belong, belong to be heard. I've heard cries of despair that put shivers down my back. And here we are, 10 years later, and Guantanamo continues to exist. No one does it continue to exist. They continue building there. Guantanamo is going to be there for a long, long time. Unless you do something. Unless you really do something. So I suggest to you that Guantanamo Bay provides powerful, powerful evidence of what I've been saying to you, of how America and the West has made war on terror synonymous with the war against Islam. So, as I come to the end of my talk, what I will say to you is that when we cave in to fear and apathy, and apathy, God, when we fear to speak out in opposition, there are no longer any boundaries to state impermissible state action and impermissible behavior. But, and if we walk away from our duty to uphold human values, human values that transcend anything else, who will be there to speak for us? But your turn comes. So as I conclude, embedded in my talk today, particularly to you, to you young people, it's your world. Go out there and make it. Express the values you want to express. We've let you down. We've got so busy trying to make money, build a house, buy a car. We've let you down. It's up to you to make people accountable. So, my talk today has been the responsibility, the imperative, to stand up against injustice, wherever you see it. And our responsibility as human beings is to speak out to the reality of inhumanity and to speak out against the hollowness of political inaction. Because in my view, whatever that's worth, the only crime equal to willful inhumanity is the crime of indifference, the crime of silence, the crime of forgetting. I would make life miserable for every politician in this country of all stripes. They wouldn't arrive home without having to meet me. And everybody, by being accountable, people have to be accountable. You have to make a new social contract. And one of the words that has to be is you won't tolerate any human destruction. What can be more fair than that? How, at the end of the day, when you're sitting in your wheelchair, you, and you're able to say, I stood up for humanity, then you can justify your life. Thank you.